We're continuing in our series to talk about having synchronized hearts, hearts that beat with the heartbeat of God. You know, God is far more interested in your heart than he is in your behavior. We tend to focus a lot on having the right behaviors, and of course God wants us to act in certain ways. But you know you can behave right, and your heart may not be right. That was the problem with the Pharisees. They followed all the right rules, but their hearts had not been converted. This is what Jesus was talking about in the Sermon on the Mount, when he clarifies one heart issue, in fact he says this for several heart issues, with a statement like this. You have heard that it was said. Here's an example of that. Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, no Pharisee would think of committing adultery. But you know, Jesus can see their hearts. In all likelihood, every Pharisee had lusted after a woman in his heart at some point. So today we're going to talk about two more of the, of the seven deadly sins. And we're looking at these because these are ways of examining what's really in our heart. And so today we're going to talk about lust and gluttony. Now these are awkward subjects for us to consider, yet they are deadly issues of the heart. As Mark Luther said, if you preach the gospel in all aspects, with the exception of the issues that deal specifically with your time, you're not preaching the gospel at all. These are difficult issues to some degree because we all struggle with our desires. You might say, well, I'm much older now and I don't struggle with either lust or gluttony, at least like I used to. Well, supposedly an aged professor at Princeton Theological Seminary was counseling a man who was dealing with lust. This professor was highly regarded for his godly wisdom and pastoral care and character. At one point, the seminarian asked him, Sir, at what age will lust no longer be a problem? The pr professor answered, I can't exactly say, but it must be sometime after 82, <laughs> because that's how old he was. You see, lust and gluttony are just as relevant today as they were the first time they entered the human heart. In many ways, they are cousins to each other. At one point in Scripture, Paul actually links the two. In writing to the Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians 6, he says, I will not be mastered by anything. You say, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, and God will destroy them both. The body, however, is not meant for sexual immorality before the Lord and the Lord for the body. So you see, it does matter what we do with bodily desires. They must not master us, but be subject to the master of our souls. Both lust and gluttony have to do with our desires. Both have to do with how we deal with temptation. Both have to do with appetites, the desire for good things that have gone out of control. Both have to do with how we cope and handle pain in our lives. Both have to do with lies that we sometimes believe about ourselves and other people. Both are indicators of where we're putting God in our hearts. As Thomas Burton said, our lives are shaped by the things that we desire. Nancy Ortberg tells about the story of her family dog, a golden retriever named Baxter, who ended up covered with ticks. So after doing some research on ticks, here's what she discovered. Ticks are actually called the overeaters of the insect world. Now for those of you who are technical when it comes to biological matters, ticks are really arachnoids. They're not insects. The difference is in the number of legs and the number of body parts. Anyhow, ticks have the disease of more. When they latch on, they can't stop. At first, they're very flat, but a tick, as you know, gorges itself on blood. Normally, they balloon up to seven to ten times bigger than their normal size. They get so bloated that when they're filled with blood, they can't move. All their energy is directed to digesting what they just filled up on. Blood. For the next several hours, 
A tick is at the mercy of its predators because it's eaten so much it can't even move. Nancy says that when she compares this to her spiritual life, she says, I have to admit that what, what I learned about ticks, there's a little bit of tick in me because I could be a picture of excess, not knowing when to say enough, not knowing when to stop, and always wanting more. It's a case of desires out of control. In some cases, desiring the wrong thing, and it's going to blow me up, take control of my life, leave me vulnerable to the predators of my soul. We live in a world of instant gratification. In our world, we have to have it now, if not yesterday. Demanding immediate gratification has become the American way, but it's not the way of God's kingdom. It's having an appetite for the wrong thing or satisfying our appetites in the wrong way. We are people of desire. Our appetites are not sinful. After all, God gave them to us, but we can choose to satisfy them in a sinful way. We want more of the wrong thing, but what we really need is more of God. To have the heart of God means the depth of the right desire, not the death of all desire. The world tempts us with unholy desires all the time. In Hank Ketchum's comic strip, Dennis the Menace, Dennis is looking for a catalog. It might have been the Christmas catalog. He says, this catalog's got a lot of toys I didn't even know I wanted. <laughs> you might say our world has become sexualized and gluttonized. Advertisements, billboards, social media, everywhere you look, the world is trying to create in us a hunger for appetites that ultimately do not satisfy. Chris West contrasts lust with love. Lust is focused on self-gratification. Love is focused on self-giving. Lust treats people as objects. Love affirms others as made in the image of God. Lust sees a body as something. Love respects a body as someone, a daughter of God, a son of God, a person made in his image. Lust sacrifices others for oneself. Love sacrifices self for others. Lust rusts at fleeting pleasures. Love yearns for eternal joy. Lust ends when the pleasure ends. The pleasure of love goes on forever. Lust enslaves. Love frees us. Lust makes a person feel toyed with. Love makes a person feel treasured. Lust in your heart gets the way in the way of loving others God's way. Lust and love are not in the same category. Lust is a soul killer and a marriage breaker. It's like being on a diet of arsenic. You take small doses and it seems like no harm is being done. But the thing about arsenic is, it doesn't kill you all at once. A little bit here, a little bit there, and over the long haul, eventually you're gonna wind up dead. A little lust here and a little lust there gradually poisons your heart against God against true intimacy, sexual or otherwise, and against living a holy life that pleases God. James says, but each one is tempted when both by his own evil desire he is dragged away and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, gives birth to death. Untamed desires are deadly. As the message says it in James 1.15, lust gets pregnant and has a baby, sin. So when you end up in the trap pursuing evil desires, you find yourself wanting more and more, and yet at the same time, wanting out. At first you think you can control giving into lust, but eventually it controls you. Lust is very demanding. There is always something more that lust wants from you. It's never satisfied. The payoff, as Paul says to the Ephesians, is a continual lust for more. Now, nothing is wrong with sexual desire. God gave us sexual desires. Honestly, none of us would be here if it were not for that. Nothing was wrong with desiring to eat food. We 
we all have to eat. Maybe you already know what you're having for lunch today. You know, food is good for you. You need it to survive. God gave us the desire for food and the enjoyment of eating food. The issue with both of these desires is how we use them and what we're trying to use them for. Both sexual desires and the desire to gorge ourselves on food can become a way of escaping the pain in our lives. Emotional eating happens when we eat in response to stress or boredom or depression, anxiety, anger, or some other unwanted emotion rather than because we're physically hungry. And so all through life, especially living in our society, this motto is plastered on our foreheads. Seek pleasure, avoid pain. Now there's nothing wrong with pleasure, and we want nothing to do with pain. The problem is when we seek to satisfy our pleasures and avoid pain in ways that cause us more pain, we end up turning somewhere else than to God when we're in need. We end up looking for something besides God to help us cope with the pain of life. Solomon tells us that the appetite for food is never sufficient to meet our greatest desires. He says in Ecclesiastes 6-7, All man's efforts for his mouth are for his mouth, yet his appetite is never satisfied. He says that seeking sexual gratification as our ultimate desire can become a trap. And so he says a few verses later, I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is a trap and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. When pleasure is what we're searching for, there's never enough to satisfy. So what's the answer for gluttony? What does God desire instead? Self-care. That you take care of yourself. That means you take care of your body. You get enough sleep. You eat a healthy diet and eat in proportions that meet your physical needs. You eat to satisfy your hunger, not to comfort your emotions. You're physically active and exercising. You're growing your mental life, stimulating your mind, aware of your thoughts and how they are affecting you, confronting the enemy's lies and living in the truth. You're paying attention to your emotions. You're expressing them to God and perhaps to others. You're taking a Sabbath. You know, you're resting and you're nurturing your spiritual life. You're growing in your relationship with God by allowing Him to remake you into His image as a beloved child of God. You see, that's the answer for gluttony. What does Jesus say about lust? He says, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Now, this is hyperbole, which means Jesus is exaggerating to make a point. Obviously, you can gouge out both of your eyes and still lust. Jesus is saying you need to get radical when it comes to lust. He's saying you need to get radical with your thoughts and with your eyes. You need to get radical so as to not lust in your heart. Guard your mind. If Satan gets your mind, he gets you. That's why Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 3.2, Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Where your mind is set is where your heart will be also. You need to capture your thoughts for Christ. Take them captive, as Paul tells the Corinthians. That's radical. When impure thoughts come into in your mind, and you can't stop them from coming into your mind, but you can switch your mental gears to think of whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or thing, praiseworthy, Paul says, think about such things. And so watch your eyes. Be aware of what triggers lustful thoughts and avoid those situations. Seek God when your flesh is warring against you. What is the ultimate antidote for lust? Intimacy. God desires for you to experience intimacy, love relationships, building a love relationship with Him first, and then building a love relationship 
to somebody that you love as much as they love you. You see, lust is, is an attempt to fill an intimacy hole in your heart. It just doesn't work. Lust leaves you relationally bankrupt. It has you focused on yourself and using people instead of loving people. Seek to, to love the God who loves you. Seek to build close, loving relationships with people. Give your love to a lover, and you won't have any desire to lust. Lorenzo Appleseed says, there's only one temptation. Only one. All particular temptations are expressions of this original temptation. It's the temptation to believe that the fulfillment of human desires depends entirely on us. But all your human desires require you to depend on God to help you meet those desires in a way that honors Him. All your human desires must be subject to one desire, and that's God Himself. The only way you can satisfy all your desires rightly is by making God your number one desire. Jesus says it this way in Matthew 5, 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. So what does the first thing Jesus do when he's publicly recognized as the Messiah? What does he do on his first day on the job? Well, he doesn't wow anybody with a miracle. He doesn't preach a stirring sermon. He doesn't even resurrect somebody from the dead. What does he do? The very first thing he does is he goes out into the wilderness and for 40 days, he eats nothing. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine going 40 days without food. I think I would be hungry a lot sooner than 40 days. I'm sure he was as well. For 40 days, Jesus emptied himself by choosing hunger. Why would he choose to do this before he did anything else as the Messiah? He did it to make a definitive statement about the central question of humanity. The most important question any person can ever ask is this, what will fill my hungry heart? Jesus was making sure that unrestrained appetites didn't get a hold of him. Unrestrained appetites get bigger and bigger and they leave us emptier and emptier. To hunger and thirst for righteousness is to seek to live so close to God, a God who is eager to provide our needs, who will show us how to live in a right relationship with Him and others, a God who wants us to please Him and live our lives for Him. That's how our deepest hungers get satisfied. Desiring God more than anything else in every moment is the eternal bread that satisfies your soul more than anything this world has to offer. So what will transform your life more than anything else is awareness of God right now. Desiring Him and His will in your life above all else. You see, willpower will never change you. You can try as hard as you want to change yourself. They will never change you. What changes you is desiring to give God, to give, desiring God to, to give you His heart, His desires. God invites us to come and seek our ultimate satisfaction in Him. He says this to the prophet Isaiah, and Jesus would say this something similar to this later. Come, all who are thirsty to the waters, who have no money, come buy and eat. Why spend your money on what is not bread and your labor on what doesn't satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest affairs. You see, the richest affairs is God himself. To win the battle for your desires requires a shift in thinking. It shift in what your soul hungers for most. You must move to wanting to satisfy your desires in ways that are convenient and immediately gratifying and are not good for you to desiring what God wants most. It's a vision of living to please Him only, delighting in Him supremely, depending on Him for joy, 
and the power to stand in what brings him joy. A heart that hungers and thirsts for him above all else. Coming to desire God's will and what he desires is not something you can do by willing yourself to do it, as I just said. It's only when you choose to live close to God's heart that your own heart begins to beat with his. His desires become your desires. That's when you begin to truly pray, God, may your will be done in me as it is in heaven. As David prayed in Psalm 51 after his sin with Bathsheba, creating me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing heart to sustain me. God will give you a steadfast spirit to desire what he desires, to will what he wills, to do what he wants done. It's only when we desire nothing more than God that we truly experience the freedom of enjoying everything else. All our other desires must be synchronized to him by asking him to turn our hearts to the source of all desires. God himself. God becoming our top desire. This is what Psalm 37, 4 means when it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Delighting in God is what will change your heart and change what you desire. When you desire him more than anything else, it will transform your desires. But you must spend time with God to know Him and what He desires. And do you know what spending time with God does to us? It changes us from the inside out. Before you know it, what you once so strongly desire changes because your heart changes. You grow closer to God who renews your mind by filling you with new desires, not for things of this world, but eternal desires. By delighting in the Lord, you become a new person with a new heart and desires that God promises to richly fulfill. We must desire God and willingly give ourselves to His desires. Delight in God and His desires, and it will fulfill the desires of your heart like nothing else can. This is what one man wrote after he began to seek and delight in God. He says, after God had entered my life and taken away all the destructive habits I had in my life, I still had a great problem with coveting many things. I wanted to feel and look better than I did on the inside, and before I knew it, I was buried in debt. I believe God's word when he says he will always show a way out of sin and temptation. I asked God to take these parts of me that I couldn't control and help me to give them to him. So God moved me from my house to renting a little basement apartment. I threw out a lot of stuff. I began giving it away, selling it, sending it to people, and I'm still selling and giving away what I've coveted, the stuff I desired most. When I gave it away, brought healing and a sense of freedom that I never received when I went out and bought it. I've learned how to trust God and love God, how it feels to hurt God, and how great it feels to be forgiven. I've also learned how to love what God loves. I've learned to walk in His joy and appreciate the beautiful things I already have. I've learned how to let go of things. I now live with the desire to please God and not myself. I'm learning God's voice in my heart, and I'm becoming obedient to it. And God, in His amazing and quiet way, has begun to change my heart from a coveter to a giver, to give me completely new desires. This is what Paul had in mind when he urged the Christians in Ephesus to do the will of God in your heart. What God desires is that the actions of your life flow out from the inner longing for Him and the desire to honor Him with all that you are. Only when you desire to honor God more than anything else will you experience the freedom of truly enjoying all things. And so as Jesus 
ask his disciples, he asks you this morning, what do you really want? What do you want most? What is the true desire of your heart? Is the desire of your heart Him? Him. Because that's the only thing that will change all your desires so that you enjoy every desire that God gives you. Would you stand with me as we pray? Lord Jesus, I want to thank you that you created us with desires. It's part of being human. It's part of being made in your image. You gave us a desire for good things. For us to enjoy you, to enjoy our relationships with others, to enjoy life. But Lord, this world constantly pushes our desires in other directions other than you. Father, help us this morning to desire you more than anything else. That for you to become the delight and the joy of our heart, where everything in our life we want it to be done in honor to you. And so, Lord, change our hearts so that we desire you above all else. And out of that, desire, Lord, to fill our life with joy. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.